Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Martin Rauchbauer. I'm the director of the Deutsches Haus at NYU, and we're going to uh, present a new book by Jonathan Franzen, The Kraus Project, tonight. And I want to welcome Jonathan Franzen, Daniel Kielmann, and Paul Reiter. <laughs> Jonathan Franzen probably needs no further introduction. Uh, he's the author of four novels. The Corrections won the National Book Award, Strong Motion, and The 27th City. His latest novel, Freedom, also hugely successful, two collections of essays, uh, and a personal history, The Discomfort Zone, and translation of Frank Wedekind's Frühling's Erwachen, Spring Awakening, all published by FSG. He lives in New York City and Santa Cruz, California. Daniel Kehlmann, to my left, he's the author of six novels. His novel, Die Vermessung der Welt, in English, Measuring the World, has been translated in over 40 languages and has become one of the most successful German novels of the post-war era. His latest novel has the same, starts with the same letter as Jonathan Franzen's latest novel. It's, uh, ju but it just remains with that letter, it's F. Uh, and it just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago <laughs> in the German-speaking world. Um, Daniel Kehlmann has received numerous awards and lives in Vienna and Berlin and very often comes to New York, for which he has a very special affection. His, the English translation of F is actually already being translated and is going to come out in the fall of next year. And uh, to my very left, Paul Reiter, he is the... He's professor of German studies at Ohio State University. His first book, um, The Anti-Journalist, was about uh, Karl Kraus. It's a study of Karl Kraus. And his latest uh, published book has the title On the Origins of Jewish Self-Hatred. He's working currently on two translation projects uh, from, Ger from the German language. And in the words of Jonathan Franzen, Paul is a model of the scholar dedicated to thought and careful research. The, together, the three form the Karl Kraus Troika, um, as they call themselves. Uh, they have embarked on this project, which we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Uh, Jonathan Franzen, with this book and this project, brings Karl Kraus to a wider American audience, and maybe also to the 21st century, and we're going to structure this event tonight by hearing a reading uh, from some parts of the book. Uh, we'll talk about Karl Kraus, and uh, at some point we will open up to you and your questions. But we'll start with Jonathan reading from the beginning of the book. <clears throat> so it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, you know, Paul and I have exchanged literally, I think, hundreds of emails over the last couple of years. But we had never met. So it's particularly nice to have him here. Daniel uh, is practically a New Yorker at this point. Um, and uh, it's great to be all together in one place. Karl Kraus was an Austrian satirist and a central figure in Fan de Sieck, Vienna's famously rich life of the mind. From 1899 until his death in 1936, he edited and published the influential magazine Die Faco, The Torch. From 1911 onward, he was also the magazine's sole author. Although Krauss would probably have hated blogs, Die Fackel was like a blog that everybody who mattered in the German-speaking world, from Freud to Kafka to Walter Benjamin, found it necessary to read and have an attitude toward. Krauss was especially well known for his aphorisms. For example, psychoanalysis is that disease of the mind for which it believes itself to be the cure. <laughs> and at the height of his popularity, he drew thousands to his public readings. We'll say more about Krauss later. Um, I'm just going to read uh, the first paragraph of one of the essays in this book. Uh, Krauss is very hard to follow on first reading. Don't worry if you're not catching at all. He was, really went out of his way to be difficult. He was the scourge of throwaway journalism, and to his cult-like followers, his dense and intricately coded style formed an agreeable barrier to entry. It kept the uninitiated out. Krauss himself remarked of the playwright Hermann Barr before attacking him, if he understands one sentence of the essay, I'll retract the entire thing. <laughs> if you read Krauss's sentences more than once, you'll find that they have a lot to say to us in our own media-saturated, technology-crazed, apocalypse-haunted historical moment. 
and I hope you will. So here's the first paragraph uh, of his essay, Heine and the Consequences. Two strains of intellectual vulgarity, defenselessness against content and defenselessness against form. The one experiences only the material side of art. It is of German origin. The other experiences even the rawest of materials artistically. It is of Romance origin, and here he means Romance language, French, Italian, especially French here. To the one, art is an instrument. To the other, life is an ornament. In which hell would the artist prefer to fry? He'd surely still rather live among the Germans. For although they've strapped art into the Procrustean folding bed of their commerce, they've also made life sober, and this is a blessing. Fantasy thrives, and every man can put his own light in the barren window frames. Just spare me the pretty ribbons. Spare me this good taste that over there, down there, delights the eye and irritates the imagination. Spare me this melody of life that disturbs my own music, which comes into its own only in the roaring of the German workday. Spare me this universal higher level of refinement from which it's so easy to observe that the newspaper seller in Paris has more charm than the Prussian publisher. First footnote. Krauss's suspicion of the melody of life in France and Italy still has merit. His contention here that walking down a street in Paris or Rome is an aesthetic experience in itself is confirmed by the ongoing popularity of France and Italy as vacation destinations and by the envy me tone of American Francophiles and Italophiles announcing their travel plans. If you say you're taking a trip to Germany, you'd better be able to explain what specifically you're planning to do there. Even now, Germany insists on content over form. If the concept of coolness had existed in Krauss's time, he might have said that Germany is uncool, which suggests a more contemporary version of Krauss's dichotomy, Mac versus PC. Isn't the essence of the Apple product that you achieve coolness simply by virtue of owning it? Doesn't even matter what you're creating on your MacBook Air. Simply using a MacBook Air, experiencing the elegant design of its hardware and software is a pleasure in itself, like walking down a street in Paris. Whereas when you're working on some clunky utilitarian PC, the only thing to enjoy is the quality of your work itself. As Krauss says of Germanic life, the PC sobers what you're doing. It allows you to see it unadorned. This was especially true in the years of DOS operating systems and early Windows. I liked DOS. One of the developments that Krauss will decry in this essay, the Viennese dolling up of German language and culture with decorative elements imported from Romance language and culture, has a correlative in more recent, window, more recent editions of Windows, which borrow ever more features from Apple but still can't conceal their essential uncool Windowsness. Worse yet, in chasing after Apple elegance, they betray the old austere beauty of PC functionality. They still don't work as well as Macs do, and they're ugly by both cool and utilitarian standards. And yet, to echo Krauss, I'd still rather live among PCs. Any chance that I might have switched to Apple was negated by the famous and long-running series of Apple ads aimed at persuading me, people like me to switch. It's a long footnote, and we're a little far away from Krauss, but bear with me. The argument was eminently reasonable, but it was delivered by a personified Mac, played by Justin Long, of such insufferable smugness that he made the miseries of Windows attractive by comparison. You wouldn't want to read a novel about the Mac. What would, be there to be, what would there be to say except that everything is groovy? Characters in novels need to have actual desires, and the character in the Apple ads who had desires was the PC, played by John Hodgman. His attempts to defend himself and to pass himself off as cool were funny and he suffered like a human being. I'd be remiss if I didn't add that the concept of cool has been so fully co-opted by the tech industries that some adjacent word like hip is needed to describe those online voices who proceeded to hate on Justin Long and deem Hodgman to be the cool one. The restlessness of who or what is considered hip nowadays may be an artifact of what Marx famously identified as the restless nature of capitalism. One of the worst things about the internet is that it tempts everyone to be a sophisticate, to take positions on what is hip and to consider, under pain of being considered unhip, the positions that everyone else is taking. 
Krauss may not have cared about hypnosis per se, but he certainly reveled in taking positions and was keenly attuned to the positions of others. He was a sophisticate. <laughs> and this is one reason DeFacle has a blog-like feel. Krauss spent a lot of time hating stuff he hate, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Krauss spent a lot of time reading stuff he hated so as to be able to hate it with authority. <laughs> Believe me, you color-happy people, in cultures where every blockhead has individuality, individuality becomes a thing for blockheads. The second footnote. You're not allowed to say things like this in America nowadays, no matter how much the billion or is it two billion now individualized Facebook pages may make you want to say them. Krauss was known in his day to his many enemies as the great hater. By most accounts, he was a tender and generous man in his private life with many loyal friends. But once he starts winding the stem of his polemical rhetoric, it carries him into extremely harsh registers. Those individualized blockheads that Krauss has in mind here aren't hoi polloi. Although Krauss could sound like an elitist, he wasn't in the business of denigrating the masses or lowbrow culture. The calculated difficulty of his writing wasn't a barricade against the barbarians. It was aimed instead at bright and well-educated cultural authorities who embraced a phony kind of individuality. People Krauss believed ought to have known better. It's not clear that Krauss's shrill ex cathedra denunciations were the most effective way to change hearts and minds, but I confess to feeling some version of his disappointment when a novelist who I believe ought to have known better, Salman Rushdie, succumbs to Twitter, or when a politically committed print magazine that I respect, N plus one, denigrates print magazines as terminally male, celebrates the internet as female, and somehow neglects to consider the internet's accelerating pauperization of freelance writers or when good lefty professors who once resisted alienation, who criticize capitalism for its restless assault on every tradition and every community that gets in its way, start calling the corporatized internet revolutionary. Spare me the picturesque moil on the rind of an old gorgonzola in place of the dependable white monotony of cream cheese. Life is hard to digest both here and there, but the romance be diet beautifies the spoilage. You swallow the bait and go belly up. The German regimen spoils beauty and puts us to the test. How do we recreate it? Romance culture makes every man a poet. Art's a piece of cake there, and heaven a hell. I have time to do one last footnote. Um, submerged in this paragraph is the implication that Krauss's Vienna was an in-between case, like Windows Vista. Its language and orientation were German, but it was the co-capital of a Roman Catholic empire reaching far into Southern Europe, and it was in love with its own notion of its special charming Viennese spirit and lifestyle. The streets of Vienna are paved with culture, goes one of Krauss's aphorisms. The streets of other cities with asphalt. To Krauss, the supposed cultural charm of Vienna amounted to a tissue of hypocrisies stretched over soon-to-be catastrophic contradictions, which he was bent on unmasking with his satire. The paragraph may come down harder on Latin culture than on German, but Krauss was actually fond of vacationing in Italy and had some of his most romantic experiences there. For him, the place with the really dangerous disconnect between content and form was Austria, which was rapidly modernizing while retaining early 19th century political and social models. Krauss was obsessed with the role of modern newspapers and papering over the contradictions. Like the Hearst papers in America, the bourgeois <laughs> Viennese press had immense political and financial influence and was demonstrably corrupt. It profited greatly from the First World War and was instrumental in sustaining charming Viennese myths like the hero's death through years of mechanized slaughter. The Great War was precisely the Austrian apocalypse that Krauss had been prophesying, and he relentlessly satirized the press's complicity in it. So Vienna in 1910 was a special case, and yet you could argue that America in 2013 is a similarly special case, another weakened empire telling itself stories of its exceptionalism while it drifts toward apocalypse of some sort, fiscal or epidemiological, climatic, environmental, or thermonuclear. Our far left may hate religion and think we coddle Israel. Our far right may hate illegal immigrants and think we coddle black people. 
and nobody may know how the economy is supposed to work now that markets have gone global, but the actual substance of our daily lives is total distraction. We can't face the real problems. We spent a two trillion dollars not really solving a problem in Iraq that wasn't really a problem. We can't even agree on how to keep healthcare costs from devouring the GNP. What we can all agree to do instead is to deliver ourselves to the cool new media and technologies, to Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos, and to let them profit at our expense. Our situation looks quite a bit like Vienna's in 1910, except that newspaper technology has been replaced by digital technology and Viennese charm by American coolness. That's the end of our first reading. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Viennese charm replaced by American coolness. We can really see with these footnotes how you wonderfully managed to transport uh, Karl Kraus into the present. But let's return to the text itself. Karl Kraus is often considered as practically untranslatable. Uh, or even unreadable, even for German speakers who read his long sentences. And they're not only long sentences, but they are words that one has to decipher what they really mean. Um, and it's very nice that uh, in the footnotes that the three of you have um, done together, you often come to points where all three of you agree that you have no idea what Krauss is trying to say with a <laughs> specific sentence. Tell us a little bit maybe about this translation experience. Um, how is it to translate Karl Kraus? Uh, hard. Um, translation is always hard. Uh, and there are so many barriers with Kraus. He's constantly referring to stuff. Um, and I first read him when I was, whatever, 21. And I kind of got it, and I could tell he was funny, but I had no idea what he was talking about. And um, I did these early translations, and they probably wouldn't have gone anywhere unless uh, Paul, uh, until Paul came along and said, I hear you have cross translations, and, and offered uh, kindly to help me understand what was going on. So it's... Normally, you try to avoid footnotes with, with, a, with a translated text. You feel like, I mean, yes, some factual footnotes and a few linguistic footnotes, but basically, it clutters up the text. It's not a good look. And in the case of Krauss, it's almost essential, um, if only because you need relief from him. Uh, uh, you know, just let's drop down and actually learn something about what was going on. Um, but... Uh, and it was immensely comforting, after struggling with some of the sentences for so long, to find Daniel, who grew up in Vienna, and is a big Kraus fan, saying, no idea, no idea. Because you, he was such a f scary figure that you're, you're, you're tempted to blame yourself. If you're not getting him, it's your fault, not him. I mean, he's the classic difficult author who kind of wields that difficulty to put the reader in this somewhat frightened submissive position. He's a, a difficult and, and scary author, but you also chose particularly difficult texts uh, to translate. Um, Heinrich Heine and the Consequences, uh, and we have an image of Heinrich Heine, um, which we might want to show maybe after Karl Kraus. So, so he was a very famous, important 19th century, maybe after Goethe, the most uh, important German poet, um, and Karl Kraus hated him. Uh, and wrote this uh, essay against him. Um, why do you think is this particular essay? Why did you choose it? And why do you think is it important to understand Kraus? This is considered one of his more effulgent essays. It's, it's a lot of fun um, because he's really, he's hacking down somebody who has a big reputation. Um, you know, Krauss was, I mean, Heine was disliked for political reasons, but everybody knew his poetry by heart. And, uh, and you know, a takedown, a really, really fun takedown where he's making incredible fun of Heine uh, in this brilliant language is, um, he's, it's, it's one of his better pieces. I mean, it's a famous piece in Germany, and it hadn't been translated. So, uh, you know, if you're going to do all the work, it's nice to do something that hasn't been done before. That was part of it. Um, 
you guys want to talk any more about the, the status of this essay in, in German letters? I did want to add one thing about translation. Actually, two things about Krauss and translation. I think it says something that the first person to translate Krauss into English uh, wound up trying to buy back all the volumes of his translation so he could destroy them. <laughs> he felt, uh, who was that? Albert Bloch, uh, who was a painter, um, a German-American from Kansas who spent some time in Vienna with Krauss and then went back and translated Krauss and just thought he wasn't up to you know, Krauss's linguistic standards. Although, that said, and this is the other point, Krauss himself was, he, he had a very liberal attitude toward translation. He translated from languages he didn't really know. Uh, and he took some heat for this. Um, <coughs> but his, those translations, he used existing translations and felt that he, he knew enough about the, the text, Shakespeare really, Shakespeare's sonnets, um, that he could improve upon translations done by people who, who knew English quite well. And so much of translation is about the spirit of it. And uh, I got so infected by Krauss when I was 22, 23 that I began to write like he did, which actually made it easier to go back and write like he did when I was writing his own words. You kind of, I, I internalized that style and that attitude so much that it was maybe easier to reproduce because I knew what he was up to. Maybe we come back to that uh, later, but I want to ask Daniel, um, about your relationship to Karl Kraus. I once read in an interview uh, where you were asked how you would position yourself in Austrian literature, and you said, it doesn't really matter that much for me, Austrian literature, with the exception of Karl Kraus, who, who mean, means an awful lot of you. What, 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 why Karl Kraus is so important for you? Um, I, uh, there are some other great Austrian writers who matter a lot for me, but actually Karl Kraus, in a way, matters most. Um, he, um, yeah, you get, I got at a, he's, he's actually a writer for people in their early, in their, in their early 20s, I think, in a way, because. Um, Maybe especially young white guys in yeah, their early 20s, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because then you really f can, it's this kind of anger and, and, and disgust and coming with a lot of humor, though, that you can really relate to as a, as a, as a young man. And um, I just loved it when I, I there were, uh, my, my, my father was a great um, uh, admirer of Karl Kraus, all the books, uh, meaning including a, a whole reprint of the, the, the Fackel were in our house when I grew up. And I just, um, I just loved the humor, the, um, because all the things we, we, we're going to say about Kraus um, and he's very hard to read. The, f the, 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 the strange thing is that he's also incredibly funny. Uh, not all of his essays, not all the time. He could, he, he could switch a lot between humor and pathos, but he could be very, very funny. It's a, it's a thing you don't usually have with very difficult authors. Um, and um, I just, uh, I, I, so I was really impressed by a, what he could do with language. I think when it comes to what he can do with language, he's really up with the best writers in the, in, up there with, with the best writers in the, the German language. Uh, and the other thing is, I was very impressed by some of the things he had to teach me about, um, about mass media, about mass media and manipulation, about how, um, about how deep you have to, how, how deep he was thinking about how the the mechanism of manipulation works because it's not it's not in, with him it's not a conspiracy theory there are powerful people out there and the media uh, and, 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 and they're they're uh, they're manipulating what we think about the world with him the media is actually manipulating what the powerful people think about the world who then tell the media what to say so it's kind of an an, 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 an in, in, infernal machine as he calls it where we don't we don't quite get out of it. We don't quite get out of. And, um, and uh, later, when I was a student, I was working for about a year. Uh, I, uh, I was one of many students working on a Karl Kraus dictionary of the Vienna Academy, which was not a great uh, project for many reasons. It never quite worked out. But it forced me 
to do something that you usually never did, even when you read Karl Kraus, um, not to read just the famous essays, but to read uh, uh, issues of the Fackel consecutively, like the years between 1920 and 23, all the issues. Um, when I heard you'd done that, I thought, this guy is really insane. That's I like, mean, well, the first I night I met you, you, you told me you'd been like reading the entire Fackel. No, no, not the entire. I, I know, but, but I got the idea it had been. It was like you were saying, no, no, no. like this was like. And also I got paid for it. But, <laughs> um, but the thing that dawned on me when I did this, when I got paid, uh, to do this as a student was that Krauss was actually right. So much of the stuff that is really strange and really arcane dissolves when you do, do, do the thing that he tells his readers to do, which is read the whole fuckle consecutively. So then suddenly all these arcane, illu arcane illusions, or many of them, become transparent. So all the information is actually in there. But then, of course, um, it's sometimes hard to, to locate. <laughs> Die Fackel has been now mentioned uh, several times. That was the magazine Karl Graus published and where he was most of the times, uh, the sole author. And uh, in English, uh, it has the same significance as the logo of NYU. Uh, it's the torch, uh, which is also on, on the front uh, of, of Die Fackel. And these essays uh, that you have translated, uh, appeared in Die Fackel. Um, you said that Karl Kraus uh, was incredibly funny. When other authors were funny, he sometimes didn't like it. It made a particular point out of it. For example, Heinrich Heine um, and Heinrich Heine's humor. Um, you, you came to the defense of Heinrich Heine at a certain point. Uh, w would you say that uh, Karl Kraus sometimes simply was wrong? Um, I think the Heine essay is, the importance of the Heine essay is, lies, it, it's a very funny essay, it's very well written, but also it's the moment when Krauss starts to think even deeper and more profound about, um, about modern media, especially about, about uh, the thing called feuilleton, about uh, it's hard to trans it's hard to, 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 to explain or to translate about this about the way cultural philosophy reflects in uh, or is done by mass media and uh, for him he, f he he sees at this point that Heine is the figure where he can start to make this make this point and think about it so he is of course quite unfair about Heine, although he wouldn't have uh, denied that Heine is a, is a great and important and an and, and extremely gifted writer, but also it's not just about taking down Heine. This essay is the moment when he starts to, to be what you, what, you could, what you could call a philosopher of modern, modern media. And for example, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer in their uh, uh, Dialectik der Aufklärung um, a lot of what they, when they talk about cultural industry and, 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 and media, a lot of that goes back to Karl Kraus, who was a big influence on, on Adorno. And that streak of thinking in Karl Kraus started with the Heine essay. Uh, so that's also a reason why the, the, the Heine essay is so important. And the, the Nestro essay then is the companion piece. So it made sense to then just also look at the, the Nestro uh, essay. And the essay is not uh, quite as heretical as it sometimes is uh, presented as being. Heine did enjoy enormous popularity in Germany and, and Austria. Um, Empress Elizabeth was a great Heine fan and had a monument built to honor Heine in, on her uh, palace, in, or in, her palace in, in Corfu. Um, but among modernists, uh, Heine was pretty widely disliked because of his the ease with which he can be read. You know, there, there was a, Krauss was not the only modernist to, uh, to look at difficulty as a, as a virtue and be suspicious of consumability. And, uh, author Benjamin and Gershom Scholem, Kurt Tukolsky, they all disparaged Heine. And some of the things that Krauss goes after in the Heine essay are, uh, were widely considered to be Heine's weak points, like 
Heine's great uh, polemic against his fellow German Jewish uh, critic Ludwig Berner, um, uh, written a few years after Berner died. Um, this was Heine's least popular book, and uh, where Krauss is going after it, he's in, in Heine and the consequences. You know, he's not going against received opinion there. He's, he extends it a bit, and he goes after the style of the work as well as its content. It was regarded as stylistically good, flawed with regard to content. <coughs> Krauss argues against both its style, or tries to make the case both against its style and its content, but it's not, you know, he's not uh, going it alone there, exactly. What was the problem with the feuilleton uh, that Daniel mentioned? Why was uh, Karl Kraus so angry with it? The feuilleton wa wa was, in a sense, the consequence of Heinrich Heine, as he argues in this, in this, uh, in this essay. Um, but it was not technological progress in itself that, that was at issue. He didn't, he didn't dislike technological process, but he, he disliked, in some ways, uh, what uh, journalism uh, did with it. It's of course it has to do with his philosophy of language, which uh, is, which would take, which he's very arcane about, and he wrote a book called just called Language, Die Sprache, which is his strangest and most arcane book. But he had this, um, he had a philosophy of language, which then was actually in a way influential, on an influence on Wittgenstein, who went to all Karl Kraus uh, readings he could ever get to. Um, so an, an idea of a certain purity of language which stays in somehow in close contact with the world itself and especially hybro cultural journalism uh, for him was a way to replace direct experience of the world by pre-coined phrases and do it in, a, in an intellectualized way that is actually very hard to detect. Uh, so his issue was not with tabloid papers because he thought it's of, you don't even have to you don't have to care about tabloids but it was about uh, about Neue Freie Presse which was considered the best paper of the and, and most intellectual paper of the German language and um, that was one of the things another thing was about that news, new, newspapers lending authority to people who don't deserve authority but they speak with the authority of the newspaper uh, and they don't have to prove why they have this authority. Just by working for the paper, they speak with their, everything they say comes with an aura of authority that is completely undeserved. That's why actually, because people started to talk about the possibility of television and there were some prototypes, he was in favor of television because he said, then at least you can see the faces of some people you th and, and, and that will be uh, revel revelatory. Uh, so these are just two, two, two of the points he made about, the, about the dangers of cultural journalism. Yes, I think more broadly that, that he, had a, he felt that the, the newspaper um, and particularly the feuilleton were, were eroding people's ability to imagine how things were act, what really were, that the language began to get in the way um, the language was, you know, it was pretty. It was, it was, it was practiced. It was slick, um, and it itself became this barrier to actually what was happening in the world, um, especially since everything sounded sort of alike. Uh, in the same way that, you know, you, if you, you <coughs> if you just listen to the cadences on cable news today, you don't know whether you're talking about something important or something completely trivial. It's always the same kind of rhythms of, and, you know, uh, <coughs> that, that kind of bright, ready for anything, but therefore kind of homogenizing and diminishing uh, effect that, 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 that media language has on, on what is being reported. And, 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 and we, we have to add, this is not just, for him, it, it's not just some interesting abstract problem. He believed strongly that without certain kind of mass media, uh, the, the, the First World War wouldn't have happened. So uh, he, 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 be, he really believed that certain kind of wrong use of language had destroyed the world. Shadows cast bodies yeah. uh, in his famous formulation. Yeah. Um, that, 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 and and here, let me try one more time. The notion of shadows casting bodies 
instead of bodies casting shadows, is that, that, that you get inside the kind of echo chamber of media and things begin referring to them, each other within the mediascape and it becomes, you, you, you go down into the bubble and you don't come out. And, and, and when you do that, well, you start, um, you know, you see it with, with some of the phrases that, that gave us the Iraq War, that people have been repeating these, these phrases in, in these think tanks so many times that they, it, you don't even see, well, actually, that doesn't apply here. And, you get, and, you, and, 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 and he really thought there were actual political consequences in the form of, of wars that, that came of people just getting locked in these echo chambers. Is, uh, and Paul will refine that. Um, well, I can repeat it um, uh, or rephrase it. I, I get into this stuff in the section that I read. Maybe okay, I, maybe sure. This is a good moment. Yeah, good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. On the first page of the first issue of Bifaco, Krauss proclaimed that nothing would move him from a standpoint that was openly polemical and radically independent. Beholden to no one and to no party line, he would be able to carry out polemics from all perspectives, as he put it a little, a little later. Yet even as he underscored his independence, he didn't shy from tying it to an agenda that invited him to be taken for a progressive reformer. In the first issue of De Faco, De Faco he announced his intention to expose the obfuscations of the established press, a prostitute that wears the robes of a priestess, his words, so that it would be easier to recognize the really urgent social problems. In the second issue, he invoked LaSalle's motto, state what is. Another early mission statement emphasized that Bifaco would give the oppressed a voice. Krauss wasted no time in making good on his pledges. He hammered away at all parties and ideologies in reporting on the dysfunction in Austria's parliament. And in 1900, he championed the cause of the Galician coal miners who had gone on strike against their exploiters. And that's again, I'm, I quote Krauss a fair amount without really saying it, it kind of works in the footnotes because there are quotation marks in here. I don't know, I'll do something to try to indicate that I'm quoting him. If it sounds outrageous, it's probably Krauss. From him, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Krauss would take many other stands, uh, many other kinds of stands too. He, he heaped scorn on the, report, on the supporters of, of Alfred Dreyfus during Dreyfus' second trial. He belittled the women's movement. And in the years before World War I, which he famously opposed, he sided with the old Austrian order. After the war, he went through something of a socialist phase. But Krauss's political interventions, or really his peregrinations up and down the political spectrum, aren't the main reason he's so hard to place politically. He had two primary programs in trying to improve society. And while these programs were always interdependent, they had different political valences. Reactionary theory and revolutionary practice didn't just coexist in Krauss's work, they fed off each other. For Krauss, as for, say, Marx, liberal faith in progress was the worst sort of ideology. Technological progress was being driven by hubris and greed, and it was increasing civilization's destructive capabilities, not just its productive ones. And Krauss was frightened by the enormous potential for abuse. One aphorism from around 1908 goes, progress celebrates the pyrrhic victory over nature. Another, progress will make purses out of human skin. A key factor for Krauss was that technology and modernization were diminishing the space that our imagination and in turn our capacity for sympathy needed to thrive. When the general catastrophe ar arrived in the form of World War I, Krauss believed that it was caused in large part by a failure of the Austrian imagination, which wasn't strong to begin with and which had been fatally enfeebled by the mass press at a moment of unparalleled technological might. In this time, in which one can no longer imagine must happen, reads a representative quote from his uh, first essay about the war. Part of his response to this diagnosis might be characterized as romantic conservatism. Often with nostalgia for better days he hadn't experienced himself, Krauss fought to keep open space for the imagination by campaigning against the modern things that got in its way, the feuilleton, with its addictive and thus lucrative offering of prepackaged emotional responses to the news, psychoanalysis, which according to Krauss, analyzes the dreams into which the disgust it elicits tries to escape, <laughs> and so forth. Glad somebody laughed. Thank you. Um, but another part of Krauss's response was to promote enlightenment in the Kantian sense, that is, to call for mental maturity. 
I want the fruit of my labors to be that reading is done with sharper eyes. Krauss, to be sure, sometimes directed his readers to see his writing as the result of a kind of mystical submission to language. I have only mastered the language of others. Language does, language itself does whatever it wants to with me. Yet he stressed as well that an important purpose of his revolutionary style, which, influ which influenced such experimentalists as Schoenberg and Brecht, was to force readers to read more alertly in the hope of revitalizing the Austrian mind. His audience shouldn't necessarily read different newspapers. They should read differently. They should speak and write differently, too. Krauss exhorted his readers to think as hard as they could about their linguistic options. Doing so was, he believed, the best practice for ethical decision making. Because our deliberating over language usually takes place with neither the threat of punishment nor the prospect of gain hanging over it, have, hanging over it excuse me, it can teach us in a uniquely unconstrained way to hesitate, to have scruples, and to be sensitive to nuance and thus particularity. There was a time when these ideas resonated, more even than Krauss's claims about journalism and the Great War, they were, they're what prompted critics to credit him with seeing, as one of them put it, the connection between mistreated words and mistreated bodies. It's also been said that Krauss's Enlightenment project was a bust. Elias Canetti, for example, argued that Krauss was too authoritarian a figure to encourage intellectual independence in other people, and that his style overwhelmed readers more than it stimulated their critical faculties. That Krauss had an Enlightenment project is harder to contest, and that he never gave up on it is impressive, especially given his low opinion of the people whom he was able to reach. He was only half joking when he quipped that the worst thing his audience members could say about him was, I know Krauss personally. <laughs> One of the disorient, disorienting things about reading Krauss today is that he often sounds simultaneously un-PC and PC. In a PC way, he bashes the liberal culture of the press for its leveling of difference, but he does this in a way that's calculated to sound wildly un-PC. His scabrous critique in Heine and the Consequences is a great example. The problem with Feuilletonists is at once their mindless worship of a canon, Heine, and their difference leveling false subjectivity. They act like they're giving their subjective impressions and yet they all sound alike, as was said. Uh, uh, so this is in fact the opposite of subjectivity. And, they, and Krauss complained that they all taste alike in Heine and the Consequences like, like rotten eggs. The, the faculty is full of such lines. The newspaper speaks like the world because the world speaks like the newspaper. The tone is always the same, no matter what the topic. Thus, Krauss's PC-seeming predilection for minor and marginalized forms is very much in keeping with his hatred of, liberal, of the liberal culture of the time, which he saw as an assimilation-driven, snobbish agent of conformity. It's also worth noting that Krauss's critique of, Zion, that Krauss's critique of Zionism was that it was assimilationism masquerading as a movement devoted to sustaining difference. Zionism was the Jews' imitation nationalism. This can be a pretty PC argument these days, and Krauss made it in 1898. And here's a sad irony. Krauss's fight against the cliché has lent itself to being characterized in clichéd terms. Even Clive James does some of that. To read James on Defacle, you would think that Krauss tirelessly went after every platitude and sloppy formulation that bothered his ears. Thus, nothing got past him, or at least anyone who let, slu let slip a loose phrase lived to rue it if Krauss caught him. What these well-worn overstatements obscure is that Krauss was interested in the emblematic infelicities, the ones that he could reveal to be both a symptom and a cause of social ills. At its best, Krauss's cultural criticism presents us with a feedback loop wherein bad circumstances and motives lead to bad prose that makes the world vastly worse. The press may have begun to gain the upper hand. The virtual reality of the media may have begun to determine the external reality that it's supposed to cover, shadow, now shadows now throw bodies in Krauss's formulation. But Krauss didn't imagine that the language of the press developed independently of its material conditions. Often, in fact, the importance of language misuse is that it allows us to recognize a dangerous underlying corruption. That one is a murderer doesn't necessarily tell us something about his style, but his style can tell us that he's a murderer. Because James misses this point, it's easy for him to accuse Krauss of being more one-sided about historical causality than he was. According to James, Krauss, the language-obsessed satirist, failed to appreciate sufficiently that 
the world is made up of more than language. Similarly, James reproaches Krauss for coming close to suggesting that the war had been caused by bad journalism. Then he adds, with an implied sigh of impatience, if only it had been that simple. James also conjectures that Krauss might have found instruction in the despotic past had he been more historically minded. There's certainly something to that last claim. Krauss showed no inclination for tracking how historical events unfold over time or for figuring out how complex webs of factors produce them. You could say that he analyzed key features of his age in a series of aphorisms, some funny, some not, which he supported with thousands of pages of commentary and painstaking, often breathtaking work with the evidence, but which he didn't try to put into meaningful, meaningful narrative concepts. And Heine, example, Heine and the Consequences is also a, a good example of this. Um, for me, what's striking about the third Walpurgisnacht, uh, Krauss's great work about fascism, isn't so much the lack of humor or effective satire as the absence of aphorific insight, aphoristic insights. This incidentally may explain the book's odd shape. Without such insights to ground him, and Krauss often inserted his aphorisms directly into his essays and built upon them. He does this a number of times in both the major essays translated in, in the Krauss project. Um, without such insights to ground him, uh, Krauss appears to be at sea. He goes on and on. The third Walpurgis Night is probably five times longer than Krauss's second longest essay. Of course, much of what Krauss writes in it has merit. The book contains detailed accounts of Nazi violence, and it forcefully calls out cultural authorities, men like Gottfried Benn and Martin Heidegger, whose support helped legitimate the Nazi movement by conferring upon it the cachet of poetry and philosophy in the country that fancied itself the land of Dichter und Denker. But Krauss's performance nevertheless feels wrong-footed to speak with James. Liberally translated, Krauss's opening line reads, no ideas about Hitler occur to me, and it proves to be an apt warning. Krauss wasn't able to muster for Nazism the kinds of provocative aphoristic distillations that serve as the basis for so much of his work. The closest he gets in the Third Walpurgis Night is that famous first sentence. You now ended uh, with uh, talking about uh, Krauss's relationship to fascism. Um, he uh, didn't experience fascism in his own, uh, he didn't experience national socialism in his own country because he died uh, two years before the Anschluss in 1936, but he did um, defend uh, the regime in Austria that was a kind of a fascist regime as well. Um, was he, when it came to dictatorship, to tyranny, was he wrong-footed? Was, was his analysis um, helpless when it came to analyze the real dangers of the 20th century? Well, I should say that one of the uh, pleasures of the book, and uh, for, for, or at least writing the book, um, and the difficulties of extracting footnotes from it, is that uh, there's kind of a running dialogue in the footnotes about various aspects of Krauss, and sometimes one topic leads to a response. And so that part I read about the third wall, Purgis Night, is a response to something that John had said about it in response to James's piece, which takes up this issue of uh, Krauss in the face of, of fascism and when Krauss's satire was, uh, was at its most effective, where it's at its most effective. Yeah, the thing, the thing about the third wall, and Daniel has a third point of view on this. Yeah, I don't agree at all. Yeah, yeah. but I, I, don't, I don't think that's a funny book because the Nazis were on the rise and it wasn't really very funny. Uh, uh, there was just no way to, to, to there was something inhumane about that about their rise from the start, and, and and to me it's like as long as there were these old social structures, um, he could be funny, uh, and because none of the stuff really mattered. I mean, basically, stuff was being taken care of. He was very very uh, obviously he was incensed by the First World War. His his greatest work, I think, is his play The Last Days of Mankind. Uh, which is basically an 800-page textual document consisting entirely of things he read or overheard during the First World War. And it's a very, very damning document about the ways in which people persuaded themselves that things weren't so bad and the ways in which the, the profiteers uh, masked what they were doing in these high-flown 
phrases and all and on and on and on. Um, but it, it was still not, you know, it, it was still a, it was a familiar social structure, and the Nazis were basically destroying that. And it's much, what do you do in the face of that? I, I think he basically went on, and I'm with Paul, he goes on and on and on. Clearly these are people are terrible, clearly they're lying. What's the point of a satirist? You know, this is brute force, exposing the fact that they're lying, they're not even pretending not to lie. That's part of, that's the, that's part of the violence they're doing. So, so the whole, the satirist is kind of, as I say, a child of a well-ordered house. You need something, you know, yes, disgusting, but not completely alien to, to, to be reacting against. Uh, and, and, when, and when the truly alien evil thing comes along, it's like, where do you begin? But Daniel's gonna take up a defense of that book. Yeah, I would defend that book. I think um, uh, where to go, he goes to Shakespeare. So the whole, it's, it's, it's if, if you look at the, the, the third Walpurgis Night as a, as a work of art, it's, it's a big, strange endeavor in intertextualism. He uses Shakespeare's Macbeth and uh, uses, he not, doesn't just use quotes from Macbeth to confront that with the reality of, of, of the Nazi, of what happened when the Nazis came to power, which he saw close by in, 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 in Germany, knowing that they would come to Austria soon. Um, he had this strange idea that somehow by looking at the greatest works of literature, you can understand the world better in a way that they even, he uses the word pref prefiguration, that they even prefigure what happens. So you will understand better what's going to happen in the world when you read Macbeth now. And he does, a, for me, he does a very convincing job there. Um, uh, it's, it's, he, he, he's not funny anymore. The whole tone gets lifted into high pathos, which for me really works well because when should you become uh, when should you resort to pathos, uh, if not in a, in, in a moment like that? And also another aspect of, of the Third World Purgis Night is that, which is not unimportant, it's a great piece of documentary literature. There is so much in there which you can use to disprove anybody who says that in 1934 you couldn't know what the Nazis were all about. Um, anybody who says that you can show him uh, qu quotes from newspapers uh, which are kept in, in, in Third World Purgis Night and, and, and prove that it's just not true. If you were just alert and intelligent, you could know everybody, everything that was, was happening. And um, I think another important, so, so I would, although I can see it, the book, it, it does go on and on and on and it could maybe uh, have used some trimming, but uh, I think it's really, an, an, it's, it's, it's next to Letzten Tage der Menschheit, it is his most important book for me. I have to say one sentence about him uh, defending the Austrian fascists, which you, you mentioned, the Austro-fascists, that came out of the fact that he saw so much clearer than most other people, in my opinion, the nature of the danger. So he was convinced that Austria did not stand a chance uh, and that the, the Nazis would just uh, would just come to power in Austria too. And Dolfus, whom he did support, was the only p politician whom he believed was actually fighting that. He was the only person who was standing in the way of Hitler to come to Austria. And then Hitler killed Dolfus. So um, although, of course, Dolfus was, Dolfus was not a democratic politician, and it's never a nice thing to see when a writer defends politicians who are not... Uh, Democrats, um, I still can see, I, I would not, I, I still can see his point here because he saw Dolphus was the only one who would, as long as Dolphus was alive, uh, Hitler would not come to Austria. Yeah, and then Dolphus got killed. And he wrote a very moving uh, obituary, uh, which is still, even if you, if you see that Dolphus was actually a terrible guy, <laughs> it's still a very moving obituary. <laughs> Coming back uh, to Karl Krauss's relationship to the Nazis, um, he was actually very able to write in a very short, concise, and very beautiful and also moving way about uh, the danger of Nazism uh, in this poem uh, that you translated and that you uh, are going to read to us now. Yeah. 
So it's, it's uh, a short poem. Um, uh, the, the context of that poem, I will, it, I, I, I will, will then yeah, explain will get in the footnote I'm going to read. I'll, 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 st I'll read the poem in German. It's very short, and then I'll read the, the English translation. Man frage nicht, was all die Zeit ich machte. Ich bleibe stumm und sage nicht, warum. Und Stille gibt es, da die Erde krachte. Kein Wort, das traf. Man spricht nur aus dem Schlaf und träumt von einer Sonne, welche lachte. Es geht vorbei. Nachher war es einerlei. Das Wort entschlief, als jene Welt erwachte. Let no one ask what I've been doing since I spoke. I've nothing to say and won't say why. And there's stillness since the earth broke. No word was right. A man speaks only from his sleep at night and dreams of a son that joked. It passes and later it didn't matter. The word went under when that world awoke. Let no one ask is a poem about appropriateness, the right word for the right occasion. For decades, Krauss had hounded stupid journalism, incorrect usage, bad usage, and everything else wrong with the late feudal bourgeois society stultified by the media. But now, suddenly, he was confronted with a phenomenon of an entirely different order, a thing more evil and horrifying than perhaps any the world had ever seen. In contrast to so many of his contemporaries, Krauss recognized this circumstance immediately. He saw what was new about national socialism. He understood what Hitler was trying to do, and he was under no illusion that all this could end in anything but an epochal catastrophe. And so at first he wrote nothing. There was no reaction from Karl Kraus to Hitler's seizure of power. Month after month went by, and the fackel failed to appear. Kraus admirers expected that he would eloquently attack Hitler, criticize him, condemn him, mock him, but instead not a word. From today's standpoint, it seems easy to understand this silence as precisely the commentary whose failure to appear so appalled Kraus readers. And yet it was simply not appropriate to take the same words and the same raging tone in which the Neue Freie Presse, Franz Leha and Max Reinhardt had been attacked and applied them to Goebbels, Göring and Hitler, as if there were ultimately no difference between them. So Kraus remained silent, unshakably so, even as many of his followers turned away from him. All the while, as we know now, he was writing a lengthy book from which he would much later, in July 1934, print excerpts under the title Why the Fackel Isn't Coming Out, and which appeared in its entirety as The Third World Purgis Night, only posthumously, which also, by the way, ought to forever put to rest the idea that nobody could have known from the outset how dangerous the Nazis were. But finally, in 1933, in late October to be precise, nine months after Hitler became chancellor, one solitary issue of Die Fackel came out. It was four pages long, and it contained Krauss' obituary of his, uh, of his architect friend Adolf Loos, the great rationalist and enemy of Baroque ornament, an advertisement for Krauss' own translation of Shakespeare's sonnets, and the poem Let No One Ask. The poem is about the powerlessness of words in the face of a development so dark as to have gone beyond the reach of satire. Krauss was never one of the great German lyric poets, except, in my opinion, in this one moment. Let no one ask is far and away his best poem, a masterpiece of brevity and despair, its pathos immin immanent in its very laconicism. In a way, it remind, remains Krauss' most important statement about National Socialism, artistically superior even to the Third World Purgis Night, because it is so short. And we shouldn't forget that it isn't a matter of political theory. Krauss fully expected that Austria wouldn't hold out for long. For this very reason, he supported the clerical reactionary regime of the Austrian dictator Engelbert Dollfuss, whom he saw as the only politician fighting full force against this danger. He had no illusions about the cruelty of the Nazis. He had to assume that as soon as they came to power in Austria, they would either drive him to exile or kill him, which, if he hadn't been lucky enough to die of natural causes shortly before then, is exactly what would have happened. Try to imagine how Krauss would have fared in exile, and it, it can't be done. Even as theater of the absurd is just unthinkable. Let no one ask, which was admired by Bertolt Brecht and Walter Benjamin, among others, is perhaps not the best 
but certainly one of the most important short poems of the 20th century, a chilly masterpiece that gives voice to its own muteness. The word went under when that world awoke. If it's even possible for silence to be rendered in words, Krauss succeeds in doing it here. I want to ask one more question to uh, Jonathan. And that is, uh, you describe in the footnotes a lot also about the time when you got to know uh, Karl Kraus, uh, which was the early 80s. You were two years in Germany, one year in, in Munich, and one year in Berlin. And those were also, it becomes very clear when one reads the footnotes, your formative years as a writer. And uh, you mention Karl Kraus uh, very often as a kind of a paternal figure for you, uh, somebody that helped you find not only Karl Kraus, but also your own voice as a writer. Could you um, explore a little bit um, this experience, uh, how Karl Kraus helped you find your own voice as a writer? One, one of the things you feel if you're starting out to be a writer is how small you are and how powerless you are. I was never good at athletics. Um, I didn't... I, I was, you know, I was a very innocent kid. Um, and at a certain point, I started getting angry. I, I still don't entirely know where the anger came from. But you saw, or I saw in Krauss, that anger could be this kind of sword. You could, you might be small and powerless, but if you could be angry enough and, and strong enough in the way you expressed it in language, that you you might be able to feel more like a man, um, and so in in that regard, finding my way to that kind of language, finding some support for my anger, and also taking in Krauss's moral absolutism. Um, again, if you're if you are an insignificant young person. Uh, one of the refuges is to view the world in very strict terms, uh, moral terms, that, that there are, there's, there's purity and then there are the assaults on purity. It's, it's, it's really the attraction, as Daniel has pointed out. It's, uh, you, you, if you read Krauss and you read about the phenomenon of Krauss in Vienna, you get some insight into why people become jihadists uh, because it's a complete system for understanding the world. The world was once fine, and then along came this polluting force. And, and for Krauss, you know, there, there were a number of pollutants, but, but the, the liberal press was, was certainly one of them. And even though it totally didn't apply, it really mostly didn't apply to American mid-century journalism, who had spent 50 years trying to develop itself into something that was fairly objective and written in relatively uninflected language, I nonetheless became this fanatical hater of the Boston Globe and the New York Times because they were the newspapers that were destroying the world. Um, and you know that's how under his spell I was. And Obviously, at a certain point, I outgrew that. But, but in the meantime, trying to, trying to write like he did, trying to not, not be weak in, uh, in my sentences, but to, to, to have the kind of Krausian pop, and, to, and, the, and the way you can energize a page with angry satire, all of that, yeah, was tremendously important for me. Uh, and it, at a certain point, I, I, I felt I'd outgrown him. And just as Daniel said at the beginning, he's, it's, I was absolutely in the demographic to fall under his spell. Um, and, you know, it, and maybe if I'd gone on to be a satirist and an aphorist, I would, I would still be under his spell. Um, but things get a little different when you, when you become a fiction writer, and you, you necessarily are in a more morally nuanced relation with the world uh, as a novelist. So um, I probably never would have come back to Krauss had it not been for these two guys. Um, uh, Paul, in particular, was a real gadfly and just wouldn't 
leave me alone until I agreed to do a whole book. Um, and, and ultimately, I'm very grateful because, because it's, it's interesting to revisit those attitudes and to see simultaneously why you're so attracted to something as a young person and to find, you know what? Those sentences are still fantastic. You know, he doesn't disappoint at that level. And in fact, find, you know, understanding much better what's going on in those sentences, thanks to Paul's work, um, I see why this is even more interesting and, and richer and better than I thought. Um, and at the same time, in that way, to say, and yet, I also see why I let go of him. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the Kratos project, as I construe it. Uh, although the, the, the word project refers to a lot of things, and primarily we kept calling it the project, and finally thought, because the thing went on and on and on. <laughs> uh, and and I, I, I would like to take this opportunity before we go to the questions to say how grateful I am to both of you, because um, I, you know, it's my name on the front of the book, but man, did these guys work hard, <laughs> and you would not believe the number of emails and sort of hair-tearing discussions we had about lines that we finally decided made no damn sense. Um, so thank you both for, uh, for being here, Daniel especially for coming over from Germany for this, uh, and, and, and Paul for an immense amount of, of really clear work. I would I would just like to add, because we, 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 we mentioned three or four times now that sometimes we couldn't make sense of this or that. There are also many things in there we could finally make sense of. So we, were not, we, we, we were not totally unsuccessful no, I think we really hunting for sense. I think we only threw up our hands like three or four times yeah. in the entire, uh, but I, yeah, down from a list of about 150 for me to begin with. Um, well, I, I'd just like to add that uh, and this is something people will likely want to pick up on, uh, that it's a, a felicitous time to come back to Krauss. And I think that's something that, that uh, was a big part of your experience of, of coming back to him. Uh, when you were reading him in the early 80s, uh, this was around the time that uh, the first large-scale biographical study of Krauss came out, uh, Edward Timms's, uh book, The Apocalyptic Satirist. And uh, that's the, the first volume of what became a two-volume work. And, and I think it came out in 85 or 86. And it begins um, with a line like, uh, journalism changed uh, during Krauss's lifetime more than at any other time in the history of the world due to technological developments, um, rotary uh, presses and linotype machines. Um, and that was true when Tim's wrote this in 1985, but it's not true anymore. Um, and, and that does, I think, make Krauss uh, relevant in a, a new way. And yeah, and, and your idea that, uh, I, I say a little more on that because I, I, I like your formulation of what it was that Krauss uniquely recognized early on um, about the, 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 the degree to which the media and tech become an inescapable part of life and begin to, well, you say it so much better. No, no. Yes, uh, please. Do you want me to read what you said? <laughs> Why not, yeah. Let's, we're gonna finish with this right before we go to the questions. Because actually, I'm not gonna read it, I'm gonna make you read it. Because it's really one paragraph. Uh, we're talking about the uh, dis discussions of the crisis of modernity. And there were a lot of discussions of the crisis of modernity uh, in Krause's time, lots of uh, lots of people commented on how it felt to be disorienting in a kind of unprecedented way. I mean, this discussion, you know, you take back to Marx and all that is solid melts into air, and then it becomes even more radical in some ways at the, the turn of the century where people start talking about how you can no longer tell the difference between up and down, and mod modernity is characterized by the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous. It takes on a kind of eschatological flavor. And what Krauss contributed to the conversation, I think, is the insight that the rise of the mass media machine is an absolutely central part of this process. It's one of its enabling conditions as much as it's one of its consequences, not least because of the inherent antagonisms between the ascendant mass media and the privileged kind of spirituality or imaginativeness that, as Krauss saw it, makes us human. And my sense is that the key point of continuity in terms of Krauss's relevance is this dynamic rather than the persistence of a general culture of rapid change. Today, there are many people who embrace the radicalized culture of media 
as something that will finally enable us to actualize our full potential as social beings. And then there are a lot of those, a lot of them I think, who've brooded over books like Sherry Turkle's Alone Together and are wrestling with apocalyptic doubts and wondering whether our even more insane media moment will spell the end of an essential part of us, even if their notion of what, of what that is uh, differs from, from the Krausian notion of an essential imaginative spirit, and even as they themselves screw around on their iPads. For the latter group, Kraus should be an inspired voice from the past, because even if the human imagination proved more durable than he thought it would, he was the first to size up the apocalyptic seeming confrontation between mind and modern media machine, and he expressed it more forcefully and memorably than anyone else ever has. Kraus. Yeah. I, it's been great hearing the three of you talk together. I read the first part of the book the other night, and uh, the way you structured the book, the, the translations, the German original, and the in and out footnotes that are really an e sort of a running essay, in and out, in and out. I've never seen anything like it about literature or of literature. It's so different from the academic way of footnoting things. Uh, the only thing I've ever seen like it is a DVD, you know, when you're watching a movie and they've got the pundits giving you a running commentary. How did you get to the, it, but, but it's different because it's written. Um, how did you get to that? What, what part in the stage of you three working together? And then, then how, how did it happen? Because it's great. Part of it was, was inspired by Krauss himself. He was, his, his mode, especially in Tifaco, was to pick out a line and then write three or four pages about it. So he was he was he lo he was a he was an annotator himself, um, which is what makes it, what makes Defaco feel so much like a blog. Basically, it's all you know. You grab the link, and then here comes the four paragraphs on it. I mean, that was really Krauss's method it, itself. So it, the inspiration began with him, um, and and then we were having these exchanges in our emails, and it. It seemed to me that, uh, well, like you say, it hadn't been done. Um, to actually, to, to get like three voices going and footnotes all talking to each other. And, 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 and I do, you know, I had a, I realized, I was hoping to sell the book. I was hoping it would be published and I was, I was hoping people might read it. And I recognized that even with Paul's great footnotes, even with, are having like figured out almost all of the linguistic puzzles. It's still really grueling to read very much of Krauss at a time, and that that you might appreciate have something having something. You know, you can read the Krauss and then read the notes, but the, it, it was kind of like rest areas uh, <laughs> we were providing. I mean, uh, do do you remember any more about how we came to it? Yeah, I think that was really you, um, and, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to work with you. It was a lot of fun, and thank you also, Daniel. Um, my, uh, uh, one of my professors from, from Berkeley is here tonight where I went to graduate school, and I can remember when I chose Krauss as a dissertation topic, and there was a little bit of pushback and, you know, not that much interest in Krauss. I'm not trying to gloat here, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm really just, you know, trying to work up the fact that I'm still sort of surprised this is happening. I, uh, it really, I never imagined that it would happen. Um, and it, obviously it's, you know, great fun and a great treat. Um, and I think that uh, the original plan was for you to write an introduction. And then uh, the project got put on hold for a little while. You were doing other things and you wrote back. And when you wrote back, you had notes. And some of your notes responded to my notes. And you started inviting me to respond to your notes. And uh, that's how um, the the dialogue got started. I mean, one of the ironies, I suppose, of the running critique of technology is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, ridiculous stuff out there on digital humanities. I'm the director of the Humanities Institute right now, and I look at this, and some of it sounds interesting, and some of it sounds, you know, very gimmicky and trumped up about, you know, now the, the author, the single author is really going to disappear. Uh, this time, it's, it's going to happen. Uh, people have been, you know, declaring the, the author dead for a long time, and things are going to become radically more collaborative, and there are a lot of manifestos. Um, and uh, most of the time, they don't resonate with me. Um, but this is actually an example <laughs> of a, a project that, a collaborative project that was really, you know, made possible by this 
new, you know, medium. Right. I would underline that. <laughs> I, I was reading today uh, uh, Herbert Marcuse's uh, one, um, the one last event. book he wrote, The Aesthetic Dimension, and he said something about how the, now the art becomes the conscience, the moral conscience of the nation as religion starts to go down, the artist is the moral conscience. Uh, I'm wondering if that's, in your mind, a Krausian concept. And I want to thank Jonathan so much for that critique of media. We need so much of that today. When I watch Rachel Maddow and go back and forth with Sean Hannity, it just is, there's a meaninglessness of that. that uh, but what would, what would Krauss think, for example, about WBAI, though? Or, or what would he think of, of, of uh, you know, Truth Out, these kind of alternative critiques? Or even, even a Bill Moyers. Um, and, and uh, I want to, I think, um, finally, I just wanna, I wanna, I want to uh, go back to, I, hope, I don't want to embarrass Jonathan, but when, when you told Oprah, don't put that O on my book, I think that was a great moral moment in modern literature. I don't want to keep going back to that, but it was, it's that marketing machine that says everything is rolling out, the marketing plan, we're going to put the O on the book, and, the, and you said no. And that was a moral, was that Krausian or why don't, you know, I'm sorry if I embarrassed her. I thought it was heroic, it was heroic. Um, well, it's, I'm, thank you for thinking that's heroic. It was, uh, I didn't actually say no. I did worse than that. I said, um. Uh, but, um, well, uh, uh, the the other question um, the, oh with yeah, the yeah, the the Marcuse and, and God bless you for reading Her Herbert Marcuse today um, uh, we've mentioned both Horkheimer and Adorno and Marcuse tonight um, and <clears throat> those guys were also important to me um, for, and 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 really interest and it, I didn't actually know about the connection between Krauss and, and Adorno. Uh, but it makes complete sense to me now, and um, the dialectic of enlightenment really is a, a Krausian thing. I'm not. I'm personally a little. I feel like I, I'm reluctant to to burden artists who have enough troubles already with being the conscience of society. Uh, um, Krauss himself. Um, Let's talk to the Krauss expert about what Krauss would have thought of that. Well, he was, you know, contradictory on this point as and and many others, and that's one of the things that makes him, you know, fascinating. Um, he uh, he clearly considered himself an, an artist, and he considered himself a, a moral force in society, a kind of modern age, uh, Old Testament prophet, um, stylizing himself that way. Uh, but he also. Uh, was an advocate of what Adorno, you know, talked about as aesthetic autonomy, the absolute freedom of art. And one of the things about the feuilleton that he disliked so much was that it tethers art to the, to the facts and to a tight production schedule, and then it gives reporters poetic license, so everything gets ruined. Uh, poetry is bad, and the reporting is inaccurate as well. Um, so uh, I don't think that, you know, for what it's worth, he would have... Uh, been comfortable with that idea, although he was always reading morals out of art. He didn't feel that artists should be saddled uh, with, with this obligation. They should enjoy a kind of total freedom. And the big difference, and, and that's of course an argument that became very important then for Adorno and, and, and Horkheimer and Marcuse and, and, and many others, he, he, he really pointed out that the big difference between writing for a newspaper or writing as an, as an artist, there's a very simple difference it's, which is in a newspaper you have ads. Uh, and he never bought into this idea that there is something like a strict separation between uh, the advertisements in a newspaper and what the people in the newspaper write about. He went so far even to do something quite funny, which is reprint articles and not skip the ads in between, but just print them with the article, which sometimes leads to very funny um, co coincidences and, and, and textual co coincidences. So um, he was a uh, he. Uh, but 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 as for the question whether the artist is, is uh, has a moral obligation or is the the the, uh, the conscience of a society, I think 
I think he would have, he, he didn't go for most, he didn't go for abstract concepts like that anyway. So he would have, he would have said most artists are so bad that uh, uh, they, 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 they better not, they better nothing, let alone a moral conscience. So he, he despised most artists. He would have said, no, I'm a moral conscience, not artists in general. That's what he would have replied, I think. I, I want to ask you about the word imagination and how you talked about Krauss's thoughts about imagination in, or in Vienna in early 1900s. Where does imagination play into a world of open information where we think we have access to all the information um, out there through our iPhones? And um, just your reactions, all of you, on imagination in today's world. I think it does take away some of Krauss's core objection to what the press was doing. When you had people, I mean, you literally had journalists during the First World War going out and, you know, there were people missing legs and arms and, you know, rotting away with gangrene. And the reporter would, like, basically make them say, uh, the war is going well and, um, you know, I'm proud to die for my country. And this then became what people back in Vienna uh, were reading. Um, and, 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 you know, it'd be yet another kind of uh, the smoke, the haze, you know, the, the, the phrases were always the same, you know, the haze of war and the smoke and the red sun rising through the blah, blah, blah. Um, so actually getting TV cameras, you know, getting Dan Rather in, in Vietnam, um, does undercut that. The camera is a better witness. Um, and uh, you're, you're, still, you're still not necessarily forced to imagine. Um, just because the and also just because the information is there doesn't mean you go to it. Um, it's there if you want it. So uh, in terms of transparency and certain kinds of freedom, it's, it's, I think that's all a good thing. Um, but there, because it's total information, there's also lots of useless but pleasant to experience information that you can spend your time with anyway. So you can still, there are still forms of imagination deadening that can occur, it seems to me. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, I, 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 I'm going off what you said about his welcoming the advent of television, mm. um, which I, you know, and it's, it's worth stressing that Krauss, you know, he had one of the first automobiles in, in Vienna yes. and he was all for air travel. So he was like no, no technophobe in general. Um, he was so attuned to language uh, and, and, and to the aesthetics of things uh, that the technology really was, was he, his beef with technology really was, had to do with media technology. And the one thing he would have... And war technology. And, and Paul's going to give me like four <laughs> corrections. No, I was just going to add that uh, it took some real commitment and courage to uh, have an automobile in Vienna when he did. I think in, some, in 1910, there were like 40 people with cars in Vienna. And he got his not long after that. And there were like 90 accidents or something. Um, so <laughs> 40 you know, cars. Originally, you know, <laughs> you know, almost certain that you were going to, you know, at some point pay, pay the, the price for this. Thanks for such a full and fascinating conversation. Uh, I was struck by the, the, the connection between political language and the devastation of World War I uh, that, that you mentioned with, with Krauss. And I was wondering about the, the hardening of ideologies. And we saw this, especially in the US over the past 30 years, just a striking incapacity to, to, to engage with the reality as such, and instead through these cliches and these ideals compressed over time. I was wondering. Um, given that he has also a sense of, which I, f I find striking, absolute moral certainty. It seems to me absolute moral certainty is sort of the first step towards the hardening of ideology. Toward, yeah. So I was wondering in the American political context, what Mike Krauss has said about what we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, well, uh, Krauss came of, of age uh, at an opportune time for him. He founded his journal in 1899. Um, and in 1897, the Austrian political system really entered into a kind of new era of dysfunction. 
uh, due to the advent of uh, certain ideologies. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, this is Krauss thought that the three tall cultural journalism as it existed where some people were trying to practice uh, political criticism that would avoid censorship because um, there wasn't really a tradition of independent journalism in Austria as there was in, in England and um, some papers presented themselves as, as independent um, without really being independent. They uh, worked closely with the government press office and they played to the interests of their backers. Um, their financial backers and also their advertisers and Krauss delighted in pointing this out. And this he felt was really dangerous, um, this, this contradiction, which again he couldn't point out with the Nazis. And Anyway, we've already had that discussion I suppose. But so Krauss, you know, he kind of presents himself initially as a, a critic of, of ideology, all of these ideologies, Zionism, anti-Semitism, um, liberalism, um, kind of persisting on as it had under new circumstances that it hasn't adapted to. All of these ideologies are are, are bad, ruinous, really. Um, and I think it's possible to present yourself as a, a critic of ideology in a kind of strong voice um, without being a hypocrite, particularly um, if your writing style is designed in such a way that it does promote ref reflection um, and, uh, and not some sort of easy reception and, and indoctrination. Now, as I said, people have said that Krauss failed at this and that, in fact, he was too authoritarian a presence that he was, in the end, a hypocrite. Elias Canetti said that. Uh, uh, Robert Musil thought this about Krauss as well. Uh, he once said that there are two things you can't fight against, for they're too large and too wide and have neither head nor feet. Karl Krauss and psychoanalysis. <laughs> and I'm not sure exactly what he meant by this, but part of it is that Krauss, you know, is just overwhelmed uh, and doesn't, doesn't actually just creates followers and not critical recipients, which is what he said he was trying to do much of the time. I, and, and um, you know, he was, he, was a, he was a lonely figure. And, and really, the smaller the group, the more pure and, and, and stringent you can be. And just to go back to this notion of the attraction of ideological purities of all kind, to people who otherwise feel they have no power. Well, if it's really true that both sides are becoming more ideologically strict, what does it say? It's not because there's one, one, one side is in power and the other side. It's like they both feel they're not in power anymore. They, and, and <clears throat> you know, what is the, 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 the American discussion has become so clearly, well, do you want government or do you not want government? And it seems to me that part of it is the government really is becoming less essential uh, in terms of what is determining the world. I mean, you especially go to Europe. Who's the most powerful person in Europe? It's the, the head of the you know, German bank. Um, the bankers basically call up the, the heads of state and say, this is how it's going to be. Um, and, and so much of the forward logic and momentum of this country seems to be driven by what is technologically possible and what are people going to buy and, 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 and more and more of the texture of daily life. And so partly it seems like people are adopting these extreme positions out of a sense of frustration and powerlessness and also to be heard above the noise. Like, you know, you do something extreme like Ted Cruz did uh, last week because that's how you get heard now. So I, I, that's where I'm going to stop on that topic. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. I think that was uh, a, we that all was a get, very well-placed nod. I think we all got a wonderful sense uh, tonight uh, that Karl Kraus is indeed important and relevant uh, today. We tried to cover some of it in our conversation, but there's a lot more, and you can find it in this book. Uh, and if you want to buy this book, you can uh, at the entrance. We have some copies for you. Uh, Jonathan also agreed um, to stay a little bit longer and to sign uh, the books. I want to thank the wonderful Karl Kraus Troika here tonight, Paul Reiter, Jonathan Franzen, and Daniel Kehlmann. Thank you.
Thank you.